So welcome to the state of MOD and uh, MOSS panel. This panel will include a series of presentations from four fantastic speakers on the state of MOD, um, focusing on MOD deployment, adoption, and emerging trends, uh, followed by a moderated Q&A discussion. So our first presenter will be Adam Cohen. Adam will be pr uh, providing a big picture of the overall state of MOD nationwide. Adam is a senior uh, research manager at the Transportation Sustainability Research Center at UC Berkeley. Since joining the group in 2004, his research has focused on innovative mobility strategies, including vehicle mobility on demand, mobility as a service, shared mobility, vehicle automation, smart cities, last mile delivery, advanced air mobility, and other emerging technologies. Adam has published more than 35 reports peer reviewed journal articles and book chapters on innovative and emerging transportation technologies. Previously, Adam worked for the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, and the Information Technology and Telecommunications Laboratory at the Georgia Tech uh, Research Institute. His academic background is in city and regional planning uh, and international affairs. Adam's unique multidisciplinary background gives him a uh, unique insight into automation, electrification, and the potential impacts of innovative and disruptive technologies. Take it away, Adam. Well, um, it's really great for, uh, thank you for the invitation to speak. It's really great to, to be here today. Uh, next slide. So today I'd like to briefly kind of talk about mobility on demand. You know, what is it? Um, and really kind of fundamentally, mobility on demand is about the commodification of passenger and goods mobility. Uh, what does this mean? Well, this means that consumers are making increasingly complex um, travel behavior and consumption decisions based on um, how much travel um, costs, um, how long it takes to get there, journey time, wait time, and uh, possibility uh, for uh, time and cost of uh, substitutes such as digital delivery or e-commerce as well. Next slide. So this. Uh, figures from the U.S. Department of Transportation that kind of summarizes the mobility on demand ecosystem here. And fundamentally, the ecosystem includes a variety of shared modes, such as public transportation, shared mobility, micromobility, uh, for hire services, and advanced air mobility. It also includes a number of enabling services, such as integrated payment, um, you know, allowing users to pay for public transit or other services via a smartphone or other platform. It can also include incentives such as gamification to incentivize or disincentivize certain travel uh, choices. It can also include smart parking, allowing users to reserve and pay for parking on a mobile app. It can also include trip planning and navigation services, as well as a variety of other real-time travel behavior and operations data. And fundamentally, at the heart of this ecosystem is really connected travelers that really kind of consume and are influenced by all of this different information uh, and mobility services. Next slide. So what is happening now? Well, we are seeing really the convergence of five trends. Um, you know, I talked a little about kind of shared mobility, micromobility, and last mile delivery. Um, but in addition to that, we're also seeing consumers leverage um, mobility as a service or um, integrated fare payment and digital information platforms to try to kind of enhance uh, their, their mobility choices um, and to make uh, more informed uh, consumer decisions. Uh, so as I mentioned before, this is leading to the commodification of transportation, kind of the third trend. And really kind of the other two trends that we're seeing has to do with both the electrification and automation of both uh, vehicles and urban aircraft that fit into this ecosystem. Next slide. So um, one of the ways that, that we're seeing, um, you know, the public and private sector kind of work together in this space is through public-private partnerships. And so some that we're seeing uh, now is first and last mile connections to public transportation, uh, low density service uh, to fill gaps in the network, um, also, off-peak uh, services to fill um, temporal gaps in the network, uh, paratransit to help uh, provide kind of a more customized experience for people with disabilities, and to also provide services uh, at a lower cost for public agencies. 
And increasingly, in light of COVID, we're seeing uh, transit replacement being another one uh, to, to provide more cost-effective uh, mobility services through public-private partnerships and many others. And this figure on the right here is just a, shows kind of many of the existing and emerging technologies in the space that we are seeing. Next slide. So uh, our team at UC Berkeley has done some work on kind of mobility on demand public-private partnerships. And this figure depicts kind of the state of the industry right around kind of the start of the COVID pandemic. And you can see first uh, mile, last mile partnerships are shown in yellow. Uh, low density partnerships are shown in, in dark and light blue. Off-peak uh, partnerships in red and paratransit partnerships in green. And you can see that these partnerships are really evolving across the country um, in, in, in large numbers. And so one of the things that I'm excited to share is that we're partnering um, with uh, ITS America, uh, ITE, um, the Mod Alliance, um, ASHTO, and others to do an industry survey of, uh, you know, what is going on in the mobility on-demand ecosystem, the findings of which uh, should be uh, available um, later this summer. So we're really excited to be able to say that, that, that in the first industry outlook is, is currently being uh, developed. Next slide. So I talked a little bit about some of the kind of partnerships, and this is kind of one example that was uh, pre-COVID from the Maryland Department of Transportation, uh, depicting kind of their microtransit project. Um, on the left here was um, kind of their fixed route service, um, and, and you can focus in on kind of the yellow circle. And then on the right here is their proposal uh, that they had to implement microtransit service and to adjust their fixed routes. We anticipate that coming out of COVID that these types of things will be more common, uh, just as, as public transit agencies need to kind of retool uh, their routes. Um, you know, telework is changing uh, public transit, and quite frankly, it may have long-term implications because we don't know um, how many uh, commuters are going to permanently telecommute going forward. Uh, so the, the ability to kind of leverage these partnerships uh, in the future is probably going to increase in, 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 in emphasis and demand. Next slide. So where's kind of the industry headed right now? Well, obviously, um, there's a lot of consumer interest in both on-demand mobility as well as goods delivery. I think we're going to see more sophisticated applications of trying to leverage this to help manage supply and demand in the transportation network. This is a really core vision of kind of the USDOT's mod vision. Um, we're going to, I think, continue to see new services and business models as well as form factors um, driven both by electrification and automation, as well as this need um, to kind of develop new services in light of how mobility is changing in response to the pandemic recovery. Next slide. So there's a number of opportunities and challenges, and I think the biggest one in this space really has to do with uh, social equity. Uh, making sure that we ensure equity and inclusion in every aspect of mobility on demand and mobility as a service, such as access for low-income households, um, unbanked households, those without a credit card or um, bank account, uh, those households that are digitally impoverished without a smartphone or high-speed internet access to access these services. We also need to be careful about digital discrimination and kind of the adverse impacts that artificial intelligence and machine learning could have on equity, making sure that we aren't learning uh, societal inequities and programming them in to our transportation network, and also um, people with disabilities, making sure that we are providing access, but also making sure that we're properly um, conducting education outreach so that we don't have the situation depicted here where um, either the company or the users have parked scooters blocking ADA access. Um, in the rights of way, and many more. Next slide. So I'd like to kind of conclude by just kind of sharing a few resources that we have developed. Um, these are all um, available on our website at innovativemobility.org, um, offering resources in mobility on demand and shared mobility. Next slide. Um, we've also developed some uh, policy briefs um, in response to COVID. Um, including how um, 
uh, COVID uh, may impact social distancing during the recovery, as well as potential trends and indicators to watch as part of the recovery. Next slide. Um, I'm also excited to share that we are partnering with um, the World Economic Forum uh, to develop kind of the covidmobilityworks.org platform. So you can go to this public website and search different uh, types of public agency responses to COVID-19. Next slide. So with that being said, I'd just like to thank you again for the invitation to speak, and I look forward to an interactive discussion and kind of answering some questions. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Adam. That was really interesting. Um, our next present, uh, presenter will be Jacob Nelson. Um, Jake is the Director of Traffic Safety Advocacy and Research for AAA. Jake is an influential communicator and epidemiologist who provides thought leadership on issues related to traffic injury prevention. As the association's chief safety expert, Jake regularly works with transportation stakeholder groups, public health practitioners, and elected officials at all levels of government. He frequently represents the AAA Federation before state policy audiences, Congress, and US federal agencies to persuasively state the case for AAA's public um, policy recommendations and evidence-based interventions. Inducted into the Delta Omega Honorary Society in Public Health, Jake is a Mid-American Public Health Leadership Fellow alumnus and a member of the National Public Health Leadership Society. He holds an undergraduate degree from the University of Michigan, completed his graduate studies in public health at the George, at the George Washington University and in public policy at the University of Chicago. Prior to joining AAA, Jake managed a state certified health uh, department in the Chicago area where he directed public health education campaigns a portfolio of governmental uh, grant work, health-focused research and public health policy support for the state and local policymakers. Jake will offer some high-level insights from a recent national MOD survey, uh, similar to the survey Adam mentioned, uh, where we're working in partnership with uh, UC Berkeley. This survey is the result of a partnership between AAA, ITS America, and Cubic, uh, and examines public uh, perceptions of uh, MOD and MOD adoption. So take it away, Jake. Thank you, Sarah. I appreciate the introduction. And um, Adam, I'm super eager to see the results of the, the practitioner survey that you're all that you all are working on. Um, so you, you know, Sarah mentioned a little bit uh, for you about the motivation, sort of the, the topics covered by this particular survey. Um, you know, from AAA's point of view, uh, you know, we want to make sure since we represent the consumer, the end user, our goal is really to make sure that the needs and preferences of, of consumers are represented uh, as these programs are expanded or start in communities across the country. So that's really our primary motivation for the survey and how we plan to, to use the results. Um, a bit of background, this survey uh, was a, a national survey uh, we surveyed over 4,000 people ages 18 and older who were active drivers. Um, it was primarily online, but people who didn't have internet access were surveyed by telephone. Um, and the survey itself had primarily uh, four objectives here. These are just broad strokes. And for the record, I'm not gonna be providing data slides uh, for the group today. Uh, I'm going to be providing more of a narrative, high-level overview of the findings, but tomorrow at one o'clock, ITS America is sponsoring uh, an hour-long uh, uh, webinar on this survey itself, and so we'll be going through all the data in much more detail at that time. So uh, just a quick overview here of the four primary uh, goals or objectives of the survey. We want to understand who are the users of MOD services in the United States, how can we describe them? Uh, and non-users non for, that, for that matter. We also wanna understand um, you know, the attitudes and beliefs of people who've had experience in using these kinds of modes. Objective C there, we, what we did here is present two scenarios, two versions of the world uh, for respondents of the survey to describe to them sort of the ideal mod program. If we could design the perfect mod programmer scenario, how, what would that look like? How could you use it? How could you access it? 
Uh, and then more of a stepped down version where it was primarily focused on uh, several different micromobility modes and asked users or respondents to the survey a variety of questions about what they thought about uh, the programs described to them. And then lastly, we took a deep dive into understanding what are the perceived barriers or challenges to use of these services, um, regardless of whether or not somebody has uh, experience in using them. So let's jump right into the first objective here. So, you know, I'd say that, you know, mod usage in the US, at least according to our survey, users are primarily younger uh, in terms of generation, uh, are non-drivers for the most part, and live in, you know, more urban centers. Nothing that is too surprising there. Um, and so these were really the areas where in, in, this, in the webinar that we'll have tomorrow with ITS America, we'll be sort of slicing and dicing the, the survey data that we collected, looking at these different uh, demographic uh, elements of those who responded to our survey. Uh, and in this survey, we looked at how people responded to the survey instrument in urban, rural, and suburban communities, looking for differences based on the kind of community where people live. And one of the findings that we identified was that there's roughly the same number of people um, who have used mod services in urban and suburban communities, though the density of use is obviously greater in urban communities. So taking a closer look at objective B, um, I think the big takeaway here for us is that ride sharing is king when it comes to the variety of modes that would be uh, you know, captured by an ideal mod program or service um, by a long shot. So I think, um, you know, most mod users are, you know, their experience is, you know, Uber Lyft and around 5% of people who uh, responded to our, our national survey use things like bikes, e-bikes and scooters that are rentable. Um, when we ask users of, of these services th about the kinds of trips that were replaced, you know, if, if, if you know, uh, a, an e-scooter or an e-bike program or service wasn't available, how would you have completed this particular trip? And I'd say the punchline here is that um, rides that would, that would have been used, you know, leveraged Uber or Lyft, um, or an on-call shuttle, for example, uh, are replacing rides that would have been made, trips that would have been made using your own personal motor vehicle or a ride from a friend or family member. So it's, you know, vehicle trips replacing vehicle trips, and the same is true on, on the flip side. So active transportation trips were replacing other active transportation kinds of trips. Um, so, you know, I think a, a takeaway here, at least according to this survey, is that um, not, you know, these kinds of programs and services are not going to uh, replace motor vehicle traffic or address congestion in the way that people might think. So jumping ahead to objective C here. Um, now, as a reminder, this is where we presented two different scenarios. Um, and the, I don't expect you to read this, but again, one was primarily focused on micromobility modes of service and the North Star, as we call it here, is the ideal mod service or program. If we could build the perfect program, what would it look like? What would it include? How would you access it? Uh, what would its ease of, use, ease of use be? That kind of thing. Um, so when we dive in deeper there, um, we looked for, you know, how, how we could you know, wh what kinds of, of users or respondents to our survey would be more likely to use these two different scenarios. And what we found was that urban adults were more likely to use both of them uh, as compared to suburban and rural communities. Now, again, remember, we're presenting a version of the world that we know doesn't exist for people and asking them if it were available where you lived, how would you respond to the following questions? And urban adults, across the board, more likely to use either of these as compared to suburban and rural. Uh, and then if we were to dive a little bit deeper and look at just urban uh, adults who said that they would use them and tried to predict more uh, or better uh, use of either one of them, education level or achieving higher levels of education was 
Uh, the, only under, the only other demographic variable that allowed us to predict use of one of these services, and it was the North Star in particular. And uh, the last sort of major objective for this particular survey, um, this is where we want to understand perceived or real barriers to use of micromobility uh, modes of transportation or you know, mod programs and services in general. And I think over 70% uh, of people or seven in 10 respondents to the survey indicated that they did have concerns that were tied loosely to safety. And so examples would include using a micromobility mode like a scooter or a bike, for example, too close to vehicle traffic. Another example would be um, people who don't have uh, the physical capability or balance to use one of these modes. And so safety concerns around being hurt in that way. Uh, and then the third example that I would give would be con safety concerns around uh, whether or not the driver of an on-call shuttle or an Uber or Lyft driver, for example, having been properly vetted or having received a, or passed a background check as an example. So, you know, key takeaway for, for us at AAA is that uh, you know, while these programs are, uh, you know, celebrated by those who've accessed them in the past or have experience in using them, if we want them to grow in popularity and we want support for them to become uh, greater and more positive, we have to address these uh, barriers, whether they're real or just perceived. These are concerns that folks have, and it's a, a, an opportunity to address these issues moving forward. So here I have summarized just you know, some of the, the big takeaways or implications for us at AAA. And so um, you know, I'd mentioned before the kinds of trips that micromobility and mod uh, modes of transportation are replacing. And so it's vehicle replacing vehicle trips and active transportation trips being replaced by other forms of active transportation. So at least in the near term, mod programs and services aren't really going to solve for emissions and climate change issues that uh, are popular right now uh, on the national stage. Um, and and the, the issue I reported here a moment ago about, you know, real or perceived concerns about, about safety and accessing these kinds of modes uh, and services. And, and this is true for automated vehicles as well. AAA has done some, some other survey research that indicated that a majority of Americans have concerns around taking a ride in a fully automated vehicle. Uh, and whether those uh, concerns are valid or not, uh, they, they will serve to be a barrier to uptake of, of that technology. And I think the same is true here for micromobility and mobility on demand. We also asked in our survey about the likelihood or willingness of, of somebody who had access to a mod program or service where they live, uh, their willingness to give up their, their personal motor vehicle. Uh, and only 13% of people indicated that they would be comfortable doing that within the next two years, uh, given the services available where they live. Um, and so, you know, we don't expect um, this evolution of, of micromobility and mobility on demand to be the kind of disruptor that maybe uh, some providers of these services uh, might have us believe, at least not in the near term. You know, uh, coming up here on the end, um, you know, we know 60% of people in the United States who responded to the survey uh, have never used micromobility or mod services, uh, or have only used them once. Um, and regardless of whether users or non-users are uh, willing to use them in the future or they're complete naysayers, the reality is, is we have to coexist. Uh, we as automobile drivers have to co coexist with scooters, bikes, uh, Ubers, Lyfts, on-call shuttles, transit, all of it. It's not going anywhere anytime soon. And so there's value in investing and in, in helping to influence the way that these programs are launched and the way that they evolve where they already exist uh, in a way that all boats rise, that whether you're a user of, of one of these modes or services or not, um, the benefit to the community enhances for everybody, uh, regardless of whether you're a user or a non-user. 
Uh, and then importantly, especially given the aging of uh, the population in uh, developed nations like the United States, um, folks who are arguably going to benefit the most from mobility on demand are the least likely, at least according to this survey, uh, to have any interest in using it. And so I'm referring to older adults. So older drivers, super fast uh, growing population in the US. Um, most people who are um, older adults will outlive their ability to drive independently and safely by an average of seven to 10, seven to 10 years, depending on their gender. Um, and they still need to grocery shop, go to church, see their friends and family, and participate in activities of daily living. Uh, and so mo mobility on demand programs and services could really help this population in particular. Uh, and these are the folks most resistant or willing to use them, even if these programs and services were to become available in the community where they live. So huge opportunity, huge opportunity there, I think, to address uh, a massively growing uh, portion of, of the United States population. And so I'm going to stop there, but just remind everyone again that tomorrow at 1 p.m. Eastern time, we'll be going into these data in a lot more detail, showing lots of data slides and, uh, you know, slicing and dicing the results that we got in this survey much more carefully. So I'll stop there and hand it back to you, Sarah. Thank you. Great, thank you so much for that uh, great overview. And um, as Jake mentioned uh, about the event tomorrow, I've put the link in the chat for um, the audience if you wish to register. Uh, so following up on that presentation, we have Andy Taylor from Cubic. Andy is a global transportation expert with diverse experience ranging from air traffic control to multimodalism over the last 30 years. Andy is the head of global strategy for Cubic and has overseen the evolution and development of global strategy over the last six years, focusing on strategic partnerships with some of the world's leading technology and software companies. In that role, he has spearheaded the mobility as a service solution to help cities and transit agencies evaluate the potential benefits of integrated multimodal transit options. Andy is currently edu educating user communities and transit agencies on the true benefits and impacts of mobility as a service and the importance of cities taking ownership of MOSS as a multimodal management uh, model. Andy is on the MOSS Alliance Global Advisory Board, represents industry on the ITS Australia MOSS National Reference Committee, and is the chair of ITS America's Mobility on Demand Alliance. Andy will provide follow-up to Jake's presentation and discuss how uh, MOD and MOSS is evolving. Take it away. Thanks, Eric. <clears throat> so thanks for the introduction. I, I think it was just listed there all of the different sort of associations that I'm working with. But as part of that and as part of my role with Cubic, I do actually get to talk to a lot of cities as well, uh, a lot of public agencies who are looking at ways of embracing private mobility service providers, mobility on demand and mobility as a service as a means to augment and grow a public transportation network. Um, from what I've seen uh, globally, it's a uh, a fairly evolving discussion. But if nothing else, the, the conversation over like the last few years has really changed in the way that agencies are perceiving mobility as a service and mobility on demand. For like the last five years, we've seen a lot of discussions um, being forwarded by the likes of Uber and Lyft and Line Bikes and uh, Mass Global, uh, um, they're all of those sort of large venture capital funded private mobility and private mass operators have really sort of been pushing hard uh, to actually get uh, mobility on demand landed. And of course, you know, that they're of a breed where they are high risk, and they're very well funded, they want to get immediate return on investment. So they've been pushing very hard on this and they need cooperation from public agencies as well, who are low risk, have very limited budgets, uh, and they sort of really want to understand the solutions that they're investing in. Uh, and what we've seen uh, from some agencies is this reticence to actually fully embrace simply because of the, the risk associated with it. There are many private mobility service providers that are uh, that were, were functioning six months ago that don't exist today. So what happens if a city sort of uh, invests time and money into sort of integrating them into a private into a public transportation network 
and then they uh, disappear overnight. And that's been an instance that's happened uh, in a number of com uh, countries, most notably in Singapore recently when the, uh, the bike share uh, solution sort of disappeared overnight and it left a lot of residents with uh, money in accounts and no way of accessing sort of services to come up with that. But that, that's some of the downsides of it. Now, what we are seeing now is post COVID, um, because agencies have had their public transportation network decimated, um, they've had to really sort of pare back their services, pare back their routes. Uh, and what they are looking at now is how they can embrace private mobility service providers and how they can bring them into the sort of community to help provide better services, to help augment the public transportation network about how can they do it in an effective manner? How can they do it whilst delivering on equity? How can they deliver it uh, in a sort of simplified manner that is uh, bringing together these solutions so that everybody has access to the mobility services? It's not just those with smartphones and credit cards at the end of the day that the private mobility service providers are sometimes influencing. Uh, we are seeing a lot of these pilots sort of, uh, the, the pilots, um, evolving into actual sort of programs as well. Now, there, there continues to be a dearth of programs going on in Australia. Uh, they seem to be really looking at this as ways of augmenting the public transportation, but also providing reach into the rural communities. They see the, the sort of demand responsive transport mobility on demand pilots as a way of sort of growing uh, an, an, uh, a population uh, to, so that they actually embracing these sort of solutions from early days uh, and sort of, you know, don't re require a car to actually sort of uh, move around the sort of environment. Uh, and they've been heavily sort of subsidized by uh, the local government, but at the same time, they are seeing increased utilization. The more people are actually using these programs, they are seeing a bigger uptake and word of mouth uh, actually has been the best sort of education for those users. Uh, and now we're seeing a massive sort of increase. And the more utility we see, the actual sort of cost of operation is being driven down. Uh, that's true in Australia. It's uh, very true in sort of Japan, where they're doing a lot of work over there as well. But they're looking at sort of property uh, and how you can sort of bring people to different sort of property locations uh, and use that as a hub uh, for sort of transit. We're also seeing uh, an increased use within Europe as well. Uh, most recently, from April the 1st this year, uh, the town of Milton Keynes in the UK has basically augmented a demand responsive transport network. Uh, which you can actually sort of go online uh, and sort of check it out. It's they've, uh, they got rid of several bus routes, uh, which were sort of not profitable and underutilized. And they working with Via Vans, they've offered a sort of mobility on demand type service where you can call it from a smartphone, you can call it from a web interface, or you can uh, call up a call center and they can get, get uh, these uh, shuttles over to you so you can move around the sort of location. Milton Keynes is not a typical city. Uh, it's not a sort of an old city. It's a, it doesn't really have a hub and spoke system. It's a very dispersed city with a very dispersed uh, sort of uh, different central business districts and transportation facilities. So it's probably an ideal location to go and sort of test out these types of solutions. But they are actually up and running now. And like I say, as from April the 1st, they were providing the, these demand responsive transport uh, on a sort of subset of the, the sort of key routes in the city, but also augmenting the, uh, replacing the sort of standardized bus services that would operate overnight and on weekends. I think that one of the biggest things that they are, that they've overcome is uh, an issue that a lot of public agencies um, uh, have found, which is about how you sort of integrate mobility on demand and mobility as a service. Uh, how do you bring that into public transport agencies, tra public transportation agencies? How do you offer a holistic solution? How can you offer the private mobility solutions alongside public? How do you overcome the issues of trip planning? How do you overcome the issues of ticketing? How do you integrate the uh, overcome the issues of uh, integrated payments? Uh, and, and a lot of the pilots that we've seen so far have still been very reliant on people having a credit card and using a credit card to uh, pay for the different sort of legs. Uh, rather than sort of a, a dedicated sort of mobility wallet, uh, should we say. Uh, some exceptions to this are obviously Transport for New South Wales, where they've been working quite heavily with uh, VIA uh, on their demand responsive transport solutions. And they've managed to integrate it now so you can pay uh, with the uh, pay for your VIA journey with your Opal card, which is the sort of uh, the smart card solution that operates down uh, in that region. Now, with this sort of uh, in, with public agencies actually embracing um, the mobility on demand and mobility as a service and demand responsive transport uh, services, 
that comes at a price. Like I say, the cities have a responsibility to provide equity. So they are looking at ways of embracing it, but at the same time, they want to maintain that sort of control and regulation of how and where the private mobility service providers can, can operate. We saw a slide earlier on that showed you sort of uh, scooters parked haphazard on a sidewalk, uh, blocking the path. Uh, where, where I live in Old Town Alexandria uh, in Virginia, that's a, a big problem that we have over here. Uh, they're very narrow sidewalks, quite often blocked, and it's been a big issue. So how can the local community, how can the local public agency control that and monitor that? Um, now they've implemented ways of sort of making sure that you actually drop off at dedicated locations. They've sort of set aside sort of parking bays where you can actually sort of park your scooter at the end. And a lot of uh, public agencies uh, outside the US around the rest of the world are looking at ways of this level of control and regulation. Can you sort of bring people on board, but basically say, OK, this is where we want you to operate. This is when we want you to operate. We don't want you to operate these types of services at these times, at these types of days. Uh, and this is a way that will give confidence to the public agencies that they can embrace private mobility and they can actually get uh, these enhanced services provided to all of their sort of different communities. Um, it continues to go uh, at full speed in Europe. There's a strong adoption to date um, with cities ranging in size from Milton Keynes, which is around 300,000, all the way up to sort of the, the whole region of the north of England and transport for the north are now looking at mobility as a service type solutions, so how you can link large towns together to provide this sort of integrated payment and sort of planning services. Uh, whole nations such as Denmark and the Netherlands are looking at the ways you can embrace mobility on demand uh, and mobility as a service. And Germany uh, is forging ahead with a whole number of small pilot programs now in dedicated cities looking to really get people out of their vehicles and to sort of embrace public and private mobility services together. Uh, from Germany, the home, of the, the home of the automobile, uh, that's a very strong message. They are very committed to sort of actually making that work. Uh, in the APAC region, obviously strong adoption in Australia, um, but we see more exper experimentation going on in Japan and in Singapore. And a lot of the private mobility service providers in China are also embracing this and sort of working heavy. And there's some good pilot programs coming out of China now as well. We're also seeing uh, you know, expanded routes in India, uh, Latin America and the Middle East. They're really starting to step up and embrace mobility on demand as well. So, there's an enthusiasm there. There's an excitement around mobility on demand. There's an excitement about what it can bring uh, to the actual user. There's an excitement about how it can help the public agencies. Uh, and I think we're at the sort of tipping point at the moment uh, of where, where we have been for like the last five years, which is where the conversation has been very heavily led by the private sector. We are now seeing the public sector, the public agencies sort of step up and want to take ownership under their own sort of control and regulation. And this sort of shift to almost mass 2.0 or mobility on demand 2.0, where the cities and uh, regions are actually taking control and ownership, I think will be a sort of a, a touch point now that's only going to help launch a bigger and better discussion about how mobility on demand can really help cities and regions grow in the future. Thanks very much. Great. Thank you, Andy, uh, for that global perspective. Um, our last presenter is Chrissy Dittmore. Chrissy is a principal with Spartan Edge Consulting, LLC. As a 15-year transportation industry veteran, she focuses on mobility for all. Chrissy advances the concepts of mobility on demand and mobility as a service to ensure the, uh, the public good is maximized through the application of technology to enable policy. She is currently on the board of directors for Phoenix Mobility, and serves on AFTA's Technology Standards Policy and Planning Committee. Chrissy holds a Master of Science in Project Management and is a 2019 Mass Transit Magazine Top 40 Under 40. Chrissy will provide perspectives on the future of MOD and considerations for moving towards building a more equitable, accessible transportation future. Thank you, Chrissy. Sarah, and thanks to everybody for attending this afternoon. When I was asked to speak on this subject of mobility on demand, seeing as the previous speakers would really be focusing on the services themselves and really linking it into that broader mobility as a service framework, which is really the framework that enables public policy decisions to be made. So I typically talk about policy 
And since that's already been covered, I wanted to elevate this portion of the discussion to really bring it into this connected and automated vehicle space to talk about how we can make mobility on demand equitable and what that means really in terms of an, a broader smart cities framework. So how these services actually fold into smart cities and what that really means. So you can see my definition of what I believe smart cities means, and that includes connecting both the infrastructure and the services. So the infrastructure and mobility on demand and mobility as a service and leveraging that to enhance citizen engagement by utilizing technology as well as community resources. So to really make that system of services equitable, the way that as an industry we need to approach that is designing for justice. So looking at when we as members of the industry are designing our services, are designing our apps, designing our solutions, do we really have all of the right people at the table to make those decisions and to build for those solutions? And I wanna say, and as a whole, you really have to have two aspects as part of that design process. So you have to have number one, the professional expertise. So if you look at our panel even today as the experts that are discussing this with you, we have a level of professional expertise and experience that allows us to say, we've built this many apps over the years and we know what kind of user design is going to work best. And then the flip side of that is what we don't see often is the lived experience that will bring that diversity that will make all of those applications meet some of those disadvantaged communities, as well as represent probably a portion of the population that no one on your team represents. So Adam talked about digital discrimination and I, I was glad that he brought that up. We saw in the last year, as more learning and meetings went online as well as conferences like we're attending today, that, that we could see how that digital discrimination is really revealing itself in our applications that we use every day. So there are some headlines that you see of what that looked like. Now, when these services were being designed, when you were at the UX meeting and you were talking about what you needed to do, you probably weren't having a conversation on, and then what does that mean for a person who has a black face or just even a darker skin tone? There probably weren't a lot of people in the room developing the solution that have that lived experience to say, I know what that's gonna look like for me and even in the testing phase. So how, when we're talking about designing mobility on demand in, in, in the future, as well as connected and automated vehicles and how those two things fit together, how are we ensuring that we have the right mix on our teams to make sure that we are designing for justice? One of these examples is this MOGO in Detroit, and they are a community-based organization offering a mobility on demand system that is doing much more a variety, I'll say, of different types of vehicles. So in addition to the digital aspect of how those people receive those services, they have a lot of different types of vehicles. So people with different physical and mental abilities can have access to the same on-demand system that really the broader population has. So when we are looking at how we can design for systems that are truly going to be equitable, are we making some of these more adaptive services ubiquitous? And that includes having a strategy that, that meets the needs of multiple kinds of users. So is there an income-based portion to en enable equity in your system? Is it integrating into your existing other services? Or is it so outside of your network that now you have a, a person that has to go way out of their way to really participate in the same system that everybody else has access to on the street corner? Now, I will say in recognition of the pandemic that in this case, these services have been suspended until May of this year. So while they might come back soon, 
we know that some of these systems aren't yet quite as resilient as we need them to be. So how are we building into the future the community-based resources that really help us address the needs of many? Part of that future means we have to remove siloed thinking. We can no longer look at our solutions as just transportation or just healthcare, because really we're going to be meeting the needs of people who through their citizen life have to have access to more than one type of solution. So a good example of that recently is Lyft's partnership with CVS Health to bring people to vaccination, to vaccination sites. So what are other examples as we move forward for how we can use a connected and automated system of services bridging in mobility on demand to be able to provide more partnered opportunities. And that brings me to within the smart cities framework, what I believe is going to be the future, especially in the short term. And that is the concept of mobility hubs. So in the bottom right of your screen, I've provided Urban Design Studios LA's definition of what a mobility hub should be. And there are really great international examples of mobility hubs that have really been ongoing for quite a long time. At its core, it means a centralized area in a community where a multitude of services are offered. Typically, there's a central branding that's associated with it. In some cases, it could be the transit agency. So Jacksonville Transit Authority has made their downtown location this mobility hub that is offering a lot of different services, including Amazon lockers. So if you check out, you can actually make your bus stop has Amazon lockers. That can be where you pick up your order for that day, which can greatly reduce really downtown traffic. So you can start to see how connecting these services, whether it's through infrastructure or technology, becomes a much more sustainable approach overall. And one of the reasons why I like Urban Design Studios definition is because it says place making strategies. Earlier, I talked about needing to have a diverse stakeholder group, not just in your team, but testing your services. Part of that is making sure that you are in the community and leveraging the resources that are community-based. So have you talked to neighborhood groups to understand what their needs actually are so that when we're designing these services, we can make sure we're designing for not just what we think as the industry they're going to need, but actually answer the call of what the neighborhood has told us they need. So thank you very much for giving me a little bit of time to talk and I look forward to your questions. Great, thank you so much to our four panelists. Um, as we move into the last 10 minutes for a Q&A discussion, if any audience members have questions um, following up on these great presentations, please feel free to put them in the chat. Um, and I'll start us off with a question to the group. Uh, so as we move forward post COVID, um, what do you guys think can be done to leverage MOD uh, to promote improved mobility, especially considering um, some concerns people might have, um, so as to encourage the use of both existing and innovative shared transportation services? And feel free to speak up um, freely, just unmute yourself when you want to. Well, Sarah, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of opportunities um, in light of COVID and, and the recovery. Um, first has to do with this kind of slow ramp up um, back to, you know, normalcy. Um, you know, carpooling um, in, a, in all of its various forms offers potentially a, an option of kind of having more social distance than you would on public transit um, and even having a trusted rider where you share a ride with. So I think, I think that's one area. The other one I have to also say are these mobility partnerships with public transportation. You know, public transportation has really relied upon um, you know, kind of choice riders, commuters that were used high performing fixed route services often to subsidize lower performing areas. And given that, you know, some telecommuters may continue indefinitely, I think there's going to have to be potentially some retooling of some of the, the fixed route services. And mobility partnerships may be a good strategy to make sure that we're meeting people's needs but also um, addressing some of the long-term fiscal challenges that public transit agencies might continue to face. Great, thank you. Um, Christy, Andy, or Jake, do you guys wanna add anything? 
Yeah, I think that one of the big concerns that all of us uh, should have is after decades of trying to teach people to share and to shift behavior to sharing, we have now worldwide asked people to be as alone as they can. And now that's the norm. And now that's what people feel safe doing. And so in, in Jake's discussion, he talked about safety and whether that's real or perceived issues. Safety is now going to go beyond simply a physical and violence-based feeling to a really a daily life of not interacting with each other. And so sharing these close spaces, how are we going to incentivize to be able to meet behaviors that we're going to need to see so that we're not drastically coming back to even worse air quality. There's an entire environmental impact here that is going to be an issue because people are coming back to a life where they're not sure how they feel about interacting with each other. Sarah, I would just make a quick comment here. You know, Chrissy talked about, I don't think you used the term feedback loop, but you described it in the context of making sure that the, the needs and preferences of people of color were represented, but that could e easily apply to people who are living with disabilities um, and different groups that we've not talked about yet today. So I love that idea. Uh, and we can we we might be able to to guess what some of those concerns would be, but we'll almost inevitably miss many of them unless we're we have that built-in feedback loop. So I think that that's important, um, and it applies to the safety concerns as well. Even if they're not real, if that's what people think, if that's what they believe, then that will be a barrier for them to use, and it will lead them to be uncomfortable in accessing these these programs. Um, and you know just in terms of ways to help get people over that hump, you know, depending on the group that you're trying to reach or, you know, the group of people you're trying to get to use these programs and services more often, I think there can be creative partnerships with trusted brands. And when I say trusted brands, I mean trusted by those people, like the group that you're trying to, to help support and to boost use of a particular program or service. Um, you know, partnering with a brand that's trusted by that group of people, I think can go a long way to, you know, increasing use of, you know, one or more modes, at least as it relates to that brand. And once they gain com comfort with that mode, as we learned through the survey that we did at AAA with ITS America, once people have experience in using mobility on demand or one of the, the many modes that is included in that, they're very happy with their experience and they're likely to use it again. And so it's just getting over that first hump that can be really important. Great. Andy, did you want to add anything before we go to our next question? No, I think you're absolutely right. It's getting over that first time. Once, once people start to experience it, start to embrace it, what we've seen is it, it, it tends to escalate. It, it becomes a word of mouth. And that's what's driving sort of increased utilization, that which helps drive down the cost, which makes it more accessible, which makes it more uh, you know, operationally effective to actually deploy these services. OK, great. And I see we got an, uh, an audience comment, which is saying, uh, you know, how do we prioritize different mobi mobility services? What what factors moving forward um, should be taken into consideration when uh, figuring out how to work with our evolving, emerging, you know, mobility ecosystem? Yeah, I, I think Sarah, you know, the way we prioritize these are based on environmental impact as as well as equity and and how well they serve, you know, diverse users. Your yeah, community I, can tell you which ones to prioritize. For the most part, they're really going to be the best source of information on not just what their needs are, but they have the history of what's already happened there. They'll be able, if, if you involve a community discussion before you even have the public forum, you will learn a lot about why they distrust certain brands, why they don't want to have a certain kind of vehicle. So Andy talked about in his neighborhood, they do have this scooter issue. So if you were going into that community and saying, we're putting in a new scooter lane, not a thing yet, but, but if you went to them and said, this is what we think your issue is, and this is our solution, 
what that community might actually tell you is a completely different issue that they're having. So the community typically will be able to tell you better than anyone else how their needs need to be prioritized to really engender dignity in their neighborhood. Yeah, great. And I would say, you know, from from ITS America's end and the work that I've been doing, you certainly hear there's no one size fits all solution. Um, you want to get input, you want to listen to what the community needs are. Um, so yeah, I, I'd say it depends and keeping an ear open. Um, Andy and, and Jake, did you guys want to add anything? Okay, we shall go to the next question. Um, so we have another audience question saying, how readily can these advancements apply to interstate and cross country travel? Oh, I'll be controversial because everybody, I mean, especially in Europe, when you start talking about mobility as a service, mobility on demand, everybody starts off about roaming and, oh, I want to be able to go here and I want to roam to here and I want to be able to use my same service and stuff. When the majority of people live, work, entertain, socialize in the same city. So why we, we spend a lot of time and effort talking about intercity and sort of, you know, cross-regional sort of operations, but it's a case of let's just focus on the communities and get the communities working together and using the services first. Let's not sort of detract from the end goal of providing better mobility solutions and start figuring out about how we connect two cities 100 miles apart uh, together. So That's I'll, it. There's... I'll, I'll... After you, Jake. I was just going to add on to that, and there's there's good data to support that point of view, right? So our survey found that like over 60% of people have never used these programs at all. Um, so starting, starting in communities makes good sense before trying to map out you know, a, a national network of connections. So I guess I'll take the opposite view here um, you know, for a couple of reasons. You know, one of the things that we found with micromobility is that some of the earliest users of you know, bike and scooter sharing both station-based and dockless were actually travelers in other communities. So people, people would travel to a location and say, oh, this looks like fun, you know, let me try it out. And then they would come back to where they were from and they would actually use it on a more regular basis. So I actually think, um, you know, there's also a network effect. We talk about, you know, a network effect locally in terms of multiple services, encouraging sharing. But I would argue that the same thing also occurs with inner city travel. That's the reason that Uber um, has become so popular globally is it's, it's kind of like McDonald's of mobility. You know, wherever you go, you know, you don't need a, a local app. You can go on your phone and get a ride. And I would argue that if we really want people to kind of share uh, modes, um, you know, we need to be, you know, making it readily available across a national, if not a global network. Um, and, and, and I think, I think there's some, some indicators to support that. And so good counterpoint. I think that that can happen through interoperability. And so the standards groups that are working on data sharing standards and API standards. So if you're looking at data as infrastructure, you also can talk about infrastructure as infrastructure. And so what does the interoperability of even our EV stations across our interstates look like? So there's probably going to be, especially as we go into a new authorization year, as well as a jobs plan, there's, there's probably in the US anyway, going to be more of a focus on how we fund these innovations. And also, the fact that this is not necessarily a technology issue, this is an interoperability issue. And so what are the baseline requirements that as an industry we're willing to move forward with to ensure that the majority of people can meet their needs? Great, and I think that's a great way to sort of wrap up our session. I loved Chrissy's earlier comment about designing for justice. I, I want to thank um, our four presenters today, Adam, Jake, Andy, and Chrissy, for the interesting discussion, and to the Center for uh, Connected and Automated Transportation for facilitating today's meeting on the state of mobility on demand and mobility as a service. So thank you all.